Tracy Carol Harris was born on March 6, 1968, and was described as sweet, shy, and hardworking. In her senior year of high school in 1986, Tracy became pregnant by Carl Harris, and they married that same year. At the age of 22, she and her young daughter, Carolyn, lived in Ozark, Alabama. By this point, she and Carl had divorced, but they continued to share the home. Tracy waitressed at a local restaurant, and Carl worked at a nearby supermarket. On March 7, 1990, Carl dropped Tracy off at their house and headed to work. After this, she was never seen again and was reported missing shortly after. A week later, her body was found in the Choctahatchee River, a few miles from her home. This area was a place where Tracy and her friends were known to frequent. The autopsy revealed that Tracy had drowned, but they also noted marks around her neck, likely indicating that she had been strangled to death. Once this crucial detail came to light, her death was ruled a homicide. Ozark police immediately suspected her ex-husband, Carl. About 14 different people came forward and said they had witnessed domestic violence between Tracy and Carl. However, Carl denied ever laying his hands on Tracy. At the time, Carl allegedly had a 17-year-old girlfriend who claimed that he said he couldn't marry her because if he left Tracy, he would have to pay child support. Despite Carl being a strong suspect, no arrest was made and the case went cold. After her death, Tracy's mother adopted Carolyn. Soon after, they left Ozark and moved to Texas, hoping to start over. Carolyn grew up being told by everyone how much her father had abused her mother and that he was likely responsible for her death. When she was 21, she finally decided to get in touch with Carl. The two met, but they never spoke about Tracy. She felt he would never tell her the truth, so she chose not to ask him any questions. When her grandmother died in 2015, Carolyn returned to Ozark for the funeral. Since she was back in town, she began asking people what they knew about Tracy and the investigation. She even spoke with the sheriff, who put her in touch with the Ozark Police Department. Around this same time, the cold case unit reopened the investigation, and all these years later, the number one suspect had not changed. The following year, on September 13, 2016, Carl was arrested for her murder despite no concrete evidence linking him to her death, and the trial date was set for January 2020. Within a week of the trial, the lead detective began going through old witness reports and came across a statement from 1990 that had not been followed up on. Tracy's close friend, Don Beasley, who had lived with the couple at one point, gave investigators details early on in the investigation about the abuse she had witnessed. Dawn said she got a first-hand glimpse into Tracy's family life and said what she witnessed was very disturbing. Dawn said she and her fiancé moved out because of Carl's violent temper and the constant fighting. Strangely, after tracking Dawn down, she refused to testify against Carl. She no longer wanted to cooperate or have anything to do with the case. However, after being subpoenaed, she finally told a secret that she had held for all these years. She knew who the killer was, and in a shocking twist, it wasn't Carl. Dawn said that on the night of March 7, 1990, when Tracy went missing, her fiancé, Jeff, had come home and woke up Tracy in the middle of the night. He said that he had gone to Carl's to talk to him, but he wasn't there, so he spoke to Tracy instead. He said he tried to talk her into leaving Carl, but she became angry. He claimed this led to a physical altercation, and he accidentally killed her. After she was dead, he took her to the river because he didn't want anyone to come home and find her body. Dawn says she told Jeff they needed to go to the police, but he insisted they keep quiet. She says she was torn between getting her friend justice or keeping quiet, but even after the divorce, she remained silent. Dawn said she was honest when police questioned her after Tracy's body was found and described seeing Carl grab Tracy by the throat and threaten to kill her. She said all that was true, but claimed she never technically lied because they never asked her who she thought had killed Tracy. While Ozark police questioned Dawn, they never got a statement from Jeff. Even after Jeff was arrested again in 1991 for burglary and spent five years in prison, Dawn kept the secret, wanting her family life to be normal when he got out. Dawn says that eventually, Jeff became abusive, and after 13 years of marriage and four children together, they divorced. And as time went on, she thought of how to tell authorities, but could never get the courage until she was forced to do so. 
Jeff Beasley was never on investigators' radar, but they did remember something from that trip to the river where Tracy's body was found. While looking under the bridge, they saw the name Beasley spray-painted in large letters. Carl's trial was then put on hold just days before it was set to begin. Police then tracked Jeff down, who was still living in Ozark, working as a trucker, and brought him in for questioning. It took a four-hour interrogation to finally break Jeff and have him confess to Tracy's murder. He claimed that he and Tracy were having an affair and went down to the river where they were waiting in the water. She said she was leaving Carl and wanted him to leave Dawn. When he refused, she threatened to tell Dawn. However, this didn't make any sense to investigators because those who knew Tracy said she was terrified of the water and even when they all hung out at the river, she never got in. Also, those closest to her said they don't believe Tracy would have ever had an affair. Carl had unfortunately spent the last three years behind bars awaiting trial. After Jeff's confession, prosecutors immediately dropped the charges against him and he was released from prison. He then sued the city of Ozark for $6 million in damages. However, a judge ruled that despite the seriousness of the situation, Carl's constitutional rights had not been violated and also dismissed claims that he was a victim of malicious prosecution. In the end, Jeff Beasley pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 30 years in prison. On May 3, 1975, a farmer found the remains of a female floating in the Nation River near Highway 417 in Castleman, Ontario. She was found wearing a navy blue, long-sleeved bodysuit, and her nails were painted pink. She had an appendix scar, webbed toes, and partial upper and lower dentures. The body was wrapped in scraps of cloth, towels, and rags, and an autopsy determined that she had been strangled with a television coaxial cable while her wrists and ankles were bound with a man's neckties. The police found blood on the bridge and speculated she was thrown into the river from the eastbound lanes of the Highway 417 bridge. It was estimated that she had been in the water a few months, maybe since the later summer of 1974, before ultimately being found. Unable to determine her identity, she became known as the Nation River Lady. Authorities sent photos of her unique dentures to nearby dentists to see if they recognized it. Unfortunately, no one did, and none of the other leads connected with the case panned out. The unidentified remains were buried, and over time, the Ontario Provincial Police made frequent attempts to identify her. By the late 2010s, Investigators in Canada had begun to hear of the success of genetic genealogy in the U.S., so they sent the Jane Doe's DNA off for testing. In 2017, a new 3D reconstruction of the victim's face was created, and in 2019, her remains were exhumed to obtain a better DNA profile for analysis. Finally, in 2020, 48 years after her body was discovered, the DNA Doe Project was able to use genetic genealogy to identify her as Jewel Langford. She was born Jewel Parchman on March 30, 1927, and was a native of Jackson, Tennessee. She came from a family of seven and grew up on a farm. Jewel, who went by the nickname Lala, would later marry Atlas Langford. Together, they opened an exercise and weight loss facility called the Imperial Health Spa. The two eventually divorced, but continued to run the business together. Jewel was also the chair and president of the Jackson chapter of the American Business Women's Association, and in 1971, was voted Woman of the Year by her colleagues. In 1975, Jewel decided to take a trip to Montreal, Canada, but would never return. When Atlas learned of her disappearance, he rallied with her family in Tennessee to search for her after reporting her missing. Sadly, they found no trace of Jewel, and her case slowly went cold. Several years after her disappearance, she was declared legally dead, and her family placed a headstone for her in a garden in Tennessee that read, Missing But Not Forgotten. The story doesn't end here because, shockingly, after all this time, Investigators had a prime suspect in her case, 81-year-old Rodney Nichols. 
Rodney was a former resident of Montreal and is said to have known Jewel at the time of her death, although their exact relationship is unclear. Rodney was a well-known rugby player among fans of the sport in Montreal, mainly among the English-speaking community in the city's western portion. At the time of his arrest, Rodney was living in Hollywood, Florida, and is now awaiting extradition back to Canada to face murder charges. This became Canada's first case where forensic genealogy was used to identify human remains. Lubitsa Topix was born on April 7, 1965, and as an infant, her family moved from Yugoslavia to Drallard Road in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, which borders Detroit, Michigan. On the evening of Friday, May 14, 1971, six-year-old Lubitsa and her eight-year-old brother Michael were playing with several other kids in a parking lot behind their home when a man came from the restaurant across the street and approached the kids. He then offered Lubitsa $8 to do a job for him, which was a lot of money in 1971, especially for a child. The man also gave her big brother a dime to go ride his bike in the other direction. He last saw his sister between 8.30 and 9 p.m., walking hand in hand with the stranger. Michael went straight home to tell his mother what happened. She hurried to the abandoned lot, but Lubitsa and the man were long gone so she flagged down a police officer to tell him that her daughter had been kidnapped. Soon, over 150 volunteers and police were on the streets looking for her. Tragically, a few hours later, at around 1 a.m. the next morning, an officer scanning yards with a flashlight found her deceased body behind a home at 1690 Hickory Road. The killer had left Lubitsa's battered body near a garage near the back alley gate. Her teeth were smashed, her leg was broken, and she had been sexually assaulted. Other DNA evidence was also collected at this time, which was unheard of and very forward-thinking of the forensic team at the time. Her brother, Michael, described the man as appearing to be in his teens or early 20s with a thin face, slender build, blonde hair, standing nearly six feet tall. Unfortunately, Lubitsa's case would go unsolved for the next 48 years. The case was reopened six times since the 1970s, with hundreds of leads from across North America, but they never led to a suspect. In 2015, DNA from the crime scene was entered into CODIS, but there were no matches. In 2016, Parabon Nanolabs conducted phenotyping to create composite images of the suspect using the DNA evidence recovered from the crime scene. A genetic genealogist then got to work narrowing down the list of potential suspects. Finally, in December 2019, the Windsor police announced they had identified Lubitsa's killer but wouldn't release his name. Windsor police said deceased individuals had privacy rights for 30 years after death, and releasing the name would be an unjustified invasion of privacy because he was dead and no longer posed a threat to public safety, which is apparently a common practice in Canada. Afterward, the Windsor Star would fight for a freedom of information battle that would drag on for over three years to release the suspect's name to the public. Thankfully, a new police chief would overturn that decision and release his name in February 2023 as Frank Arthur Hall, who was 70 years old when he died and was 22 at the time of the murder. Lubitsa may not have been his only victim, and they hope that releasing the name might help solve other unsolved crimes. At the time of Lubitsa's murder, Frank lived on the same street as them, but was not known to the family. He then moved and ultimately settled in Western Canada. He was a career criminal, and after Lubitsa's murder, was arrested for DUI and theft. Before that, he was arrested for theft multiple times and had escaped custody twice. In 1980, he moved him and his 18-year-old girlfriend to Edmonton. Some web sleuthers speculate that he may have also been responsible for the disappearance of Tanya Merrill in January of 1983 from Grosvenor Elementary School in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. She was also six years old when she went missing, the same as Lubitsa. Interestingly, Frank's kids went to the same school as Tanya.
at the age of 30, Desiree Thompson was a mother of four living in California City, California with her husband, Edward Gibson. On January 7, 2012, Desiree called her mother, Sherry Smith, and told her that Edward had kicked in their door and threatened her with a gun. She explained that she was able to barricade herself inside and call the police, and Edward fled. Her mother arrived at the home, and after talking to Desiree, Desiree decided to leave and spend a couple of hours with some friends. Around 8.30 p.m., Desiree called her mother from a friend's home and told her she was leaving for her apartment and would call her when she arrived. Her mother had no way of knowing this would be the last time she would ever talk to her daughter again. After leaving her friend's home, she stopped by a local market and was never seen again. Her husband was a person of interest because they had a history of domestic violence and because of his threats earlier that day. However, after he fled, there was no evidence that he showed back up. Sadly, Desiree would remain missing for the next 10 years. During this time, her name was entered into a missing persons database and swabs were collected from the family to create a DNA profile. Each year on the anniversary of her disappearance, Sherry would post on social media about her daughter. She continued to contact news media, ensuring Desiree's name was never forgotten. Eventually, this sparked a memory from what would become a key witness in the case. On the 10th anniversary of her daughter's disappearance, Sherry shared another post asking for information. A man told police he burst into tears and became overwhelmed with guilt when he read the post asking for information on Desiree's disappearance. He was pretty sure he knew what had happened to her and decided he could no longer remain silent. The man and his father came forward and said that Jose Lara was a man they had met through church. On weekends, they would all get together and play soccer or pool and have a few drinks. During one of those get-togethers, a visibly drunk Jose shared a disturbing story. Jose said that years ago, he attended a Diablo party in California City where everyone wore black. Some had costumes with horns and sported mohawk haircuts. Interestingly, the description of Desiree was similar to Jose's description of the woman in his story. He said that he went to the party on the night of January 7, 2012, but was asked to leave after being pushed around by a couple of individuals. He said he was angry and went home, but got back in his pickup truck and returned seeking revenge. At this point, Jose said he didn't care who it was, but he was going to take his anger out on someone. So he pulled up next to a woman who turned out to be Desiree, walking on the side of the road and convinced her to come home with him. After arriving, he told her to grab a beer from his refrigerator. He then slammed her head against the fridge before stabbing her to death and desecrating her remains. Jose even told them where he buried the body. After hearing the story, the guy and his father went to the police with the information. Authorities then got a search warrant and went to Jose's prior home in the 20,300 block of 86th Street in California City. After digging up the spot where Jose claimed to bury the body, they found Desiree's burned remains and subsequently arrested him for her murder. In May 2023, Jose Lara was convicted and sentenced to 25 years in prison. During six months in 1990, four women went missing in St. Louis, Missouri, who had ties to a section of Cherokee Street dubbed The Stroll, known for prostitution. A serial murderer known as The Package Killer began abducting sex workers in South City, killing them and leaving their bodies in containers for authorities to find. On March 26, 1990, 18-year-old Robin Meehan's body was found stuffed between two mattresses. Investigators believe she had been murdered about four days before she was found along Highway 61 and Highway E in Silex, Missouri. She had been strangled and her hands were bound. Sadly, she had just given birth to her second child two weeks before her murder. Donna Reitmeyer had her first child when she was 15 years old and married the child's father, a 17-year-old man she met at Roosevelt High School. 
Two years into that marriage, Donna left and started a new family, giving birth to her second child and marrying that baby's father as well. Donna would eventually end up in jail for drugs, and once released, she became a sex worker to feed her drug addiction. Two weeks after Robin Meehan's murder, on June 11, 1990, 40-year-old Donna Wright Myers' nude body was found inside a rubber trash can on the sidewalk along Gasconade Street near South Broadway. Unfortunately, her body was too badly decomposed to determine a cause of death. On February 17, 1991, skeletal remains were found in a dresser on the shoulder of Interstate 70 in O'Fallon, Missouri, and were identified as belonging to 21-year-old Sandy Little. On October 4, 1991, 27-year-old Brenda Pruitt's body was found inside a trash can outside a subway station in the 12,400 block of Baston Drive near Page Boulevard and Interstate 270 in Maryland Heights. She had been smothered or strangled. Her family reported her missing on May 9, 1990. The four murders became known as the Package Murders, and they went unsolved for the next three decades. In March 2022, St. Charles County Police Lab was able to obtain DNA from a condom that was found with one of the bodies. After uploading the DNA to CODIS, it matched to a man named Gary Randall Mulberg, who was already serving life in prison for murder. After being interviewed, he confessed to the murders, including a Jane Doe whose identity remains unknown. Muehlberg claimed that he had picked up the Jane Doe in his car in South St. Louis sometime in 1990 or 1991. He could not recall the order in which he had killed his victims, but remembered that he had kept this particular victim's remains in his basement for the longest period. He originally used an oversized cardboard box for storage, but due to decomposition, he switched to using steel barrels. He then claimed that he dumped the barrel near a self-service car wash just outside Berkeley, Missouri. However, no police report or documentation has ever been found about a body being discovered at a car wash in that area. Instead, the lead investigator was able to track down the son of a car wash owner in that area who said he remembered his father being upset after a body was found at their other location in Pagedale, a few miles from where Muehlberg claimed to dump the body. A former Pagedale officer also told an investigator he remembered a body was found there but didn't remember what happened after it was discovered. On February 8, 1993, Kenneth Doc Atchison went missing after going to Muehlberg's house with $6,000 cash to purchase a 1989 Cadillac Fleetwood he had advertised for sale. The two men were acquaintances, and Doc's family reported him missing. His remains were discovered in a makeshift coffin inside Muehlberg's house. After his body was found, Muehlberg was arrested at a friend's house in Wayne County, Illinois. At his trial, Muehlberg's attorneys tried to claim he was framed for the murder by drug dealers who owned a construction company for which Muehlberg had worked. However, Ron Salikas testified that Muehlberg asked him to go to his house and move a box for him. Once there, the man testified he found a box with a man's foot sticking out one end and didn't know what to do. He had supposedly been offered a 1984 Mercury Cougar in exchange for the job, but Ron declined. He said he didn't tell anyone, fearing he would be blamed for the man's murder. Muehlberg was convicted of Doc's murder in 1995 and has remained behind bars since then. Muehlberg was born in 1949 in St. Louis. After graduating from school in 1968, he and his older brother Ronald were drafted into the Army to fight in Vietnam. Muehlberg did not see combat and was stationed around various military bases on American soil. At the same time, his brother was killed in action on August 21, 1968, during one of the battles in the Mekong Delta. Upon completing his service, Muehlberg returned to his parents' home, and in June 1970, he married his high school sweetheart, with whom he had one son shortly after their wedding. In early 1972, he was imprisoned for rape, kidnapping, and aggravated robbery after an 18-year-old girl told police he entered her home, bound, and sexually assaulted her at knife point, and afterward asked if there was any money in the house. Shortly after his arrest, Muehlberg was ordered to undergo a forensic psychiatric exam, where he was found to be insane. At trial, he was convicted of the robbery charge, but was found not guilty by reason of insanity. 
After spending a month in the county jail, Muehlberg was transferred to a veterans hospital in Topeka, where he underwent treatment for several months. When he was considered to no longer be a threat to society, Muehlberg was released and returned to St. Louis. Later that month, he was arrested again for assaulting a 14-year-old girl. The victim told police that he had knocked on the door of her house, asking to use the telephone. After getting inside, he threatened her with a knife, bound and gagged her, and locked her in the bathroom. He then attempted to search the house for valuables, but was forced to flee after a car pulled up to the house. After the girl was rescued, she reported the incident to the police and later identified him as her assailant from a series of photographs resulting in his arrest. This time, he was found sane and was sentenced to five years in prison. While in prison, his wife divorced him and he lost all contact with her and his son. After being paroled in 1977, Muehlberg enrolled at the Central Methodist College where he studied psychology. After graduating, he attended graduate school at the University of Central Missouri, and in 1980, he married for the second time and had two additional children. During this period, he worked as a teacher for the Hubert Wheeler School, but soon lost interest and quit. In the following years, Muehlberg experienced employment problems and financial hardship, resorting to doing low-skilled labor and repairing houses across St. Louis. He also worked as a repairman for the Moolah Shrine Center, maintaining ground structures. His relationship with his second wife deteriorated rapidly, and they divorced in 1986, and similarly to his first wife, Muehlberg lost contact with her and took no part in raising his children. In the late 1980s, he gave up on legal ways of making money and started dealing drugs. He built a fake wall in the basement of his house with bricks, behind which he set up a cache where he stored dozens of kilos of marijuana. He spent most of his free time at one of the fast food restaurants near his home where he soon made many acquaintances. During this time, Muehlberg started frequently using the services of prostitutes, which he invited to his house. He was known as a manipulator and a liar and was generally disliked by the local community. The Bell Ridge house where Muehlberg told police he killed all of his victims has since been demolished. Janet Hakey said she remembered neighbors complaining of a smell coming from Muehlberg's house not long after Doc disappeared. She said that Muehlberg was not well-liked in the neighborhood when he lived there, and neighbors said he thought he was better than everybody else. His basement had a concrete room down there without windows or air. As of July 2023, Muehlberg remains incarcerated at the Potosi Correctional Center in Potosi, Missouri.